Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. And um, I, as everyone knows, uh, there's a lot of expertise in this room, and we've shared a lot yesterday and today. And I want to particularly thank um, Professor Kelly Clark and Adam Carroll for priming everyone for, for my presentation. So um, if, if you found, uh, for example, what, what Professor Clark had to offer as uh, new ground or slightly controversial, this is going to be more. So uh, with that, um, as mentioned by Grayson, uh, I'm with the Muslim Peace Fellowship, which is the first organization specifically devoted to the theory and practice of Islamic nonviolence. And we understand unarmed struggle in pursuit of wise, just, and compassionate social transformation to be the original and enduring genius of the prophetic jihad. And I also belong to the Community of Living Traditions at Stony Point Center, which is an intentional residential community of Jews, Muslims, and Christians who engage in peace and social justice work. And we draw upon our nonviolent and humanitarian foundations to put our feet to our faith at local, national, and international levels. And right now, as I speak, I am so happy to say that four of our community are in Standing Rock, uh, protesting in solidarity with the Sioux Nation against the Dakota Axis oil pipeline. Yesterday, about 350 clergy uh, descended peacefully and nonviolently upon Standing Rock. And today is a day of action, so we're waiting to hear what happens. Um, this discussion today comes at a time when we see unprecedented violent rhetoric and actions directed at Muslims and those who look like Muslims across the United States and particularly here in New York City. Um, recently in Queens, an imam and his assistant were shot dead in cold blood. Also a six-year-old Muslim woman was stabbed to death during Eid al-Adha. A woman in, is in Islamic garb was set on fire. And according to uh, Georgetown University uh, Bridge Initiative study on Islamophobia and, and the US presidential election season, there were 154 incidents of anti-Muslim violence in 2014 and 174 in 2015. These rates are respectively six and nine times higher than immediately prior to the 9-11 September attacks. The violence includes murder, eight in, in 2014, 12 in 2015, physical assaults, threats against persons and institutions, vandalism and property destruction, arson, shootings, and bombings. And these findings have been corroborated by a Council on American Islamic Relations CARE study reminding that the analysis of these hard incidents does not take into account many un- or underreported incidents to and by law enforcement. It does not take into account, for example, bias-based bullying in schools and university, religious discrimination in public places such as restaurants, stores, or banks, or by those seeking employment. The study found that spikes in Islamophobic rhetoric and actions in 2014 and 2015 most often correlated directly to derogatory and incendiary statements made by Republican uh, candidates for President of the United States. Rhetoric characterized by generalization, misattribution, reductionism, and blatant prejudice. Many politicians qualify such rhetoric by saying that the threat is radical Islam and not Islam, yet the outcome of sustained and intensified anti-Muslim sentiment and statements is the instillment and, and prejudices in the American, sorry, instillment and in indoctrination of deep-seated fears, anxieties, and prejudices in the American public, thus reinforcing the overarching takeaway which is that those who practice the Islamic faith are prone to acts of violence and terrorism. This opinion is contrary to polling done by Pew, Zogby, and other research institutes showing strong majorities in Muslim countries view extremist ideology as a perversion of Islam. American Muslims surveyed overwhelmingly find that Islamic faith is compatible with an American identity and Western democratic principles. 
Furthermore, according to a survey conducted by the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, there is a positive correlation between a strong Muslim identity and a strong American identity. Examples of Islamophobic fear-mongering during the presidential Republican campaign include when Ben Carson of Maryland said Muslims cannot or should not be president, and he compared Syrians to rabid, Syrian refugees to rabid dogs. Or by Ted Cruz of Texas, who stated that American Muslims are potential security risks, and he called on police to patrol and secure Muslim neighborhoods, and that only Christian refugees should be allowed into the country. Or by Donald Trump, who said that all Muslims should be banned from immigrating to the United States, that there should be a database of all US Muslims. And in March of 2016, Trump told CNN, Islam hates us, and Fox News the very same day, that 27% of all Muslims are very militant. Such sensationalism is disseminated by media outlets whose ratings surge as millions tune in to watch the spectacle for the race of the presidency. One study concluded that since announcing his candidacy, Trump had been in the lead story 36% of the time, and that he had only spent $10 million on paid advertising while receiving the equivalent of $1.9 billion in television coverage. Meanwhile, from June 2015 to June 2016, according to the Georgetown Bridge Report, Trump saw his popularity increase from 17 to 49 percent, culminating in his status as the Republican frontrunner for, front for President of the United States. The report also found that 25 percent of Americans approve of measures such as religious profiling, monitoring, internment, and mandating of special IDs. With this climate, there has been an increase in law enforcement profilings and warrantless surveillance of Muslims. And there's also been an uptick in acts of violent extremism perpetrated by Muslim identified individuals, such as the recent terror attack in New York, New Jersey, and uh, Minnesota a few months ago, the latter of which was called, uh, so was, uh, the latter of which the so-called uh, Islamic State resp took responsibility for. So what we're talking about is a United States-based conversation. Uh, however, it does have global implications. Islamophobia or fear-mongering based on anti-Muslim hate is a prevailing characteristic of United States culture. Its impact is devastating as significant por portions of the public are moved to embrace an exclusivist worldview that undermines our ideals and our hopes and aspirations for a just, loving, tolerant, and pluralistic society. Domestically, the rise of Islamophobia has resulted in the creation of a condoned underclass and surge of violent crimes against Muslims and those mistaken as Muslims. In terms of foreign policy, it manifests in a rationalization of a war on terror and congressional support for the world's largest military and defense budget. Belligerence and military occupation, neo-colonialism, and the establishment of client regimes and proxy wars. The compounded result of US belligerence against Islamic countries has been the annihilation of millions of Muslims over the past three decades and a mounting refugee crisis of unfathomable proportions for which the general US public, writ large, sees no causality, no responsibility, and no accountability. Meanwhile, the public discourse surrounding concerns about the refugee crisis centers on Islamophobic rhetoric about the influx of refugees entering the United States under the guise of being refugees. In August of this year, Mr. Trump, in a podcast interview, warned that a 9-11-like attack could occur if refugee resettlement continues. And this is in spite of a 20-step, two to four year vetting process, vetting process implemented, implemented by the State Department. Um, the uh, United States has met President Obama's goal of admitting 10,000 Syrian refugees 
during the October 2015, uh, September 2016 <laughs> fiscal year. And President Obama announced that the number will be increased to 110,000 this present fiscal year. And while a State Department official recently told NBC News that this increase is consistent with its belief that countries should do more to help the world's most vulnerable, pe vulnerable people, it is minuscule given that one, there are five million Syrian refugees alone, two, proportionally, unlike Western nations such as Germany, Hungary, Austria, Serbia, Bulgaria, Italy, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Spain, the United States refuses to settle uh, refugees proportionate to its size and capacity. And one example of a country that is, is Germany, where with 80 million Germans, uh, Angela Merkel has agreed to take 1 million refugees, which is a ratio of 80 to 1. And the third point is that the U.S. rules in the Middle East over the past 27 years is also greatly responsible for the origin, genesis, and evolution of the global refugee crisis. And while the refugee crisis is un an unconscious and unexpected burden shouldered by many Western nations, the manufacture of, is of Islamophobia is deliberate and strategic, and this is according to the Center for Race and Gender at the University of California, Berkeley. And it offers this definition of Islamophobia. Islamophobia is a contrived fear or prejudice fomented by the existing Eurocentric and Orientalist global power structure. It's directed at a perceived or real Muslim threat through the maintenance and extension of existing disparities in economic, political, social, and cultural relations while rationalizing the necessity to deploy violence as a tool to achieve civilizational rehabilitation of the target communities. Islamophobia introduces and reaffirms a global racial structure through which the resource distribution disparities are maintained and extended, unquote. Key nations impacted by Islamophobia, uh, Islamophobic foreign policy are Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Palestine, and Syria. Countries, not surprisingly, generating the most refugees. Yet, according to Dr. Arun Kunani, an expert on terrorism, race, and culture at New York University, um, many Americans don't see the causal and cyclical relationship between the war on terror and the rise and spread of terrorism. He points to US-led wars in the Middle East as catalytic in the rise of violent, extreme, ex violent extremist groups and quasi-states, such as the so-called Islamic State. The wrath of which in Syria, along with the brutality of the Assad regime and proxy wars engaged in by the United States, Russia, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and others, has unleashed 5 million refugees and 10 million uh, internally displaced people. Moreover, the United States consistently violates the United Nations Charter, which states that members shall, quote, refrain from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. In the past 15 years, U.S. hypermilitarism has had devastating effects on numerous Muslim-majority countries, including Iraq, Somalia, Sudan, Afghanistan, Yemen, Pakistan, Libya, Malia, and Syria, whose populations have endured surface-to-air missiles, carpet bombs, boots on the ground, drones, black ops, and other means of modern warfare. Most tragic, perhaps, is Iraq, the birthplace of the Islamic State, where one million have perished in a 10-year period alone of US-led war, according to a 2015 report of the Nobel Prize winning group, Physicians for Social Responsibility. United Nations figures show 1.7 million Iraqi civilians, half of whom were children, died as a result of brutal sanctions championed by a US-led Security Council. The American public, writ large, doesn't own itself as a belligerent and unchecked superpower, but rather as a coveted and exemplary city on the hill, 
that embraces religious diversity, lauds freedom, and defends liberty. In order for the United States to condone violence as a tool to achieve civilizational rehabilitation of target Islamic countries, its citizens, we the American people, need to identify Muslim nations as, and communities as threats to, Muslim, uh, to American values. Hence, according to Kanani, in spite of and because of the atrocities committed by the United States with taxpayer dollars, Islamophobia is manufactured as, quote, a lay ideology that offers an everyday, common sense, explanatory framework for making sense of mediated crisis events, such as terror attacks, in ways that disavow those events' political meanings, rooted in empire, racism, and resistance and instead explains them as products of reified Muslimness. Islamophobia then as a lay ideology of the United States government hearkens of racist, racist and xenophobic precedents and policies targeting Native American, Black, Catholic, Jewish, Japanese, and Latino communities. The strategy, malign and vilify people of a minority race or faith by playing upon social, economic, and political frustrations, engender fear, loathing, and cognitive dissonance as civil liberties are lost to domestic and foreign policies. Hence the trope of the radicalized Muslim and fear cultivated in the hearts and minds and the American, of the American psyche manifest in a prevailing, in prevailing government systems, structures, and apparatuses as media, think tanks, academia, and the nonprofit industrial complex institutionalize a domestic and foreign war on terror. This in turn garners public support for the Department of Homeland Security's Countering Violent Extremism Program, which Adam Carroll spoke against uh, just this morning, which quashes the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution and sanctions Muslim surveillance, infiltration, entrapment, imprisonment, and deportation, Islamophobia has become the internalized, articulated, and attitudinal norm. In closing, as is well known to this audience, wars against Islam and Islamic countries hurt Muslims, and they also hurt those in Western countries that propagate them. First, by inflicting moral injury and cognitive dissonance, trans transgressing deeply held ethics, beliefs, and values, such as universal human rights and nonviolence. And second, by generating an, generating an ever widening cycle of violence. According to Kunani, Islamophobia involves an ideological displacement of political antagonisms onto the plane of culture where they can be explained in terms of the fixed nature of the other. Projection in the psychoanalytic sense permits racist and imperialist violence otherwise not tolerated by liberal society and upon which militarism and neo-colonialism depend. The result is what Kanani refers to as a constant feedback loop of unintended consequences, perpetuating cycles of violence and retaliation, oppression and victimization acute and intergenerational trauma, and the destruction of families, society, humanity, and the planet. Thank you.